Bezos says one of the problems as a company grows is that they add bureaucracy. And so decision making actually slows down. And when decision making slows down, growth slows down. Hello, Profit First entrepreneurs and thought leaders. I am so excited. We have a very special guest today and a very exciting conversation. Um, we have Steve Anderson with us today. And Steve is an author of a very strong best-selling book that was listed as a bestseller on Wall Street Journal, USA Today, as well as he's an international bestseller. He wrote the book called The Basil's Letters, 14 Principles to Grow Your Business Like Amazon. And Steve, his background is strategic risk and business growth. And he really draws on his experience that he attained while he was in the insurance industry. And um, today he's just one of a major thought leaders. You know, he's handpicked by LinkedIn as one of the world's most influential thought leaders. And I'm so excited today because we're going to talk about a topic that I think we all need to hear about, especially like, you know, in a recession where we're like, or we don't even know we're in a recession. We'll talk about that today. But just the concept of risk and growth and how important it is to embrace the two and how to balance the two too. So please join me in welcoming Steve to our platform. Hey, Steve, how are you doing today? I am great, Suzanne. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to our conversation. Well, I'm excited to have this because this is so relevant. I mean, you know, we we're talking about a recession. We were talking a little bit before we got on the air. Are we even in a recession? We're not quite sure we're in a recession. And you know, I love your answer too about that, that we're just in uncertain times. <laughs> That's the only thing we really know about, right? Nothing is like as predicted of what a recession should be, right? With Because we can't hire nobody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk exactly. about this concept of risk and growth. And let's talk about the Basil's letters. And let's talk about how this idea came to you. Oh, I'd be glad to. So, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I, most of my career has been spent in the insurance industry working with um, small business clients, selling mostly business insurance. And then the last 25 years, I pivoted to helping independent insurance agents with technology, right? All the stuff. And so at, early on, you know, it was websites and why do I need one? Now it's social and right, all those kinds of things. And in that work, I started asking the question, because technology continues to develop so rapidly, is the biggest risk business face not taking enough risk? You know, and coming out of the insurance industry, really counterintuitive. Uh, but that led me to start really researching and exploring this idea. You know, why were some businesses very successful and then are no longer here? And common names, I guess now, you know, BlackBerry and Blockbuster and Sears and right, a wide variety, very successful, but are no longer here. And kind of why? And what about those that are still here? And why did they make those transitions? Or how were they able to do that successfully? Came across Amazon as a what I think to be one of the more successful companies out there for a lot of reasons. And came across the letters to shareholders that Jeff Bezos started writing uh, in 1997. So they went public in 97. His first letter uh, was published actually in the spring of 98, but for the year 1997. And was really intrigued with how those letters actually shared what he was thinking and how he operated and more information than you normally see in a shareholder letter. Um, and so then I read them all. And at the time, I think it was the the latest one was 2017. Um, the book then examines those letters. And what I did was, uh, because people don't really necessarily care when he said what, but what are the principles he used? So that's where the 14 principles grew out of. What are things that Amazon did to grow? And so I call them the risk and growth principles. So there are 14, there are a lot. We can't talk about all of them, but um, you know, I think there are a few that might resonate with um, your audience. I love that. You know, I think back to 1997. I think I was still in college at that point, but um, it was really just a bookstore, right? They were just like, it, it I was started just out of his garage at that yeah, point. Yeah. And, and a part of what's interesting, again, 97, it's hard to remember, but you know, websites were just starting to become something. And there were a few e-commerce sites, a few sales sites, but what Bezos did was really bet on the internet. And he had this vision 
that the internet would become central to what we did. And he started with books, not because he necessarily liked books, which I think he did, but they were the easiest to sell online. And the way he thought about it was, you know, the largest bookstore at the time, be that Barnes and Noble or Borders or, you know, what others had a maximum inventory of a 150 to maybe 175,000 books that you could walk in and buy off the shelf. And he realized in the internet, he would have shelf space for millions of books. And so, and one book is exactly the same as another book. So there's nothing that distinguishes it other than convenience, you know, being able to find it. So that's why he started with books, kind of to test out the idea. But very quickly, he went to uh, videos, DVDs, music. I mean, there were things that he added to that. And I think he always had in mind this idea of an everything store, meaning he could sell most anything over the internet. Then the progression of the 26 years certainly has proven that out. I love it. And it's interesting too, because, you know, 1997, I think I was still using like dial up internet, you know, it was like, oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. What is that? And, call and, America Online or <laughs> yeah. Was and, and he, I, I mean, he, again, this is part of what's interesting about the letters because he actually acknowledges that I think in 98 or 99 that the experience online was awful, slow. You had to wait. Um, you had to put in credit card information every time. Nobody was storing it for you. I mean, all these things we're used to today. And he realized that it would just get better. So the time they spent building what they did early on certainly paid dividends very much down the road. And that's one of the principles, which is apply to long-term thinking. You know, one of the things he said in the original letter is that we are building something we'll tell our grandchildren about. So he very much had a long-term vision for where things could go and worked literally day by day to um, build that vision out. And um, again, I think we look at it now going, huh, I wonder if I could have had that idea. <laughs> I was there in 97. I didn't have the idea. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> me neither. I think I was just frustrated by the dollop at that point. Yes. So Steve, let's talk about some of these 14 principles. Let's talk about some of the major principles because you know our group is entrepreneurs, right? They're all yep. applying profit first. And I'll be honest, at one point in profit first, you know, as you're crossing levels, especially when you get to that, there's a point that you go from the category to half a million to a million, and then you go from 1 million to 5 million. And one of the things that people really struggle with is, you know, the percentages change. And if you're 5 million, you're making more. But if you're 1 million, 100, you're actually making less because you're now investing more in your team. So your operating expense goes up. And let's talk about that risk reward, that exchange that happens and just the thinking that we need to have in order to scale. So let's talk yep. about that. Great. So I broke the 14 principles into four cycles, test, build, accelerate and scale. And I did that because I believe every business, regardless of size, is going through those cycles. So when you're new and smaller, you know, smaller revenue, you're testing ideas, right? And then those ideas that appear to be working, meaning somebody's buying it, right? Or paying you money for it. And then you build on that. And then you accelerate that growth. And then Maybe when you get to that, and we can talk about those different levels, like moving from a million to 5 million, that's scaling. That's a whole different set of problems and things you need to protect against as a business owner uh, when you get to those levels. So the first principle in the test cycle is I call encourage successful failure. And this is this idea of needing to experiment to find out what's going to work. And one of the things Bezos says several times is Amazon is the best place for an employee to fail because he understands that connection between failing, learning, adjusting, and experimenting again. And so I believe we hear a lot of talk today about businesses need to be more innovative. I actually think that's backwards. They actually need to experiment more and invent on behalf of the customer 
and then they can innovate. They can update, they can change. But this idea of being focused on the customer and being willing to fail to move forward. Now, I got to pause because I always have to say Amazon has an intolerance for incompetence. So it's not just, oh, let's see what happens. It's very thoughtful. It's very um, planned. And they have several tools that help them not fail. So their goal isn't failing. Their goal is success. But they know to get where they need to be, failure is part of that process. And how can they learn from it and then move forward? I love it. I love it that, you know, that's just part of that growth and to get to that point to innovate. If I have a minute, let me give you an example, just because I know this one's a bit harder to, I think, makes people uncomfortable. I believe one of Amazon's big failures, I won't say their biggest, but one of their big failures was uh, in 2014, Bezos got on a stage in New York City and announced the Amazon Fire phone. So Amazon actually built and released a phone, mobile phone. Now, seemed kind of crazy because... 2007, Apple released the first iPhone. Android phones were already out and becoming popular. Why did we need another phone? Well, it was Bezos' pet project. So even thinking about that is he's not always right. (laughs) And it utterly failed to the point that toward the end of 2014, they reduced the price of the phone to 99 cents and they couldn't give it away. And they wrote off at the end of 2014, $178 million in development and inventory cost. Oh, no. Big failure, right? And now I know some people are thinking, I don't have $178 million. They were a much bigger company at that time. Here's the success. So everything they learned about developing a phone, voice processing, right, antennas, and those kinds of things, they were able to transfer into another project that actually four months after Bezos announced the phone, he got his first demonstration of, which was a cylinder that sat on a table that you could talk to, and it would answer you with your question, the answer to your question. Well, we now know that as the Echo, which is the hardware, and Alexa, which is the machine learning software that actually does the lookup and voice processing and and those kinds of things. And so, One of the real technological advances of Echo is what's called far field voice. So I can stand on the other side of my kitchen and say, Alexa, set timer for 18 minutes. And it understands me and it does it. I mean, that's actually technologically pretty impressive. So I think we could agree the Echo slash Alexa has been a pretty successful product. But without the failure of the phone, would they have gotten there? I don't know, but it certainly helped move it along faster. I love it. I know exactly what you're talking about, Steve. My my 14-year-old daughter has started cooking and like she plays her Alexa in the kitchen and it activates all the Alexas in the house. So right. I mean, like they're all trying to find her music <laughs> station. I'm like, wait a minute, stop. I don't want to listen to that. <laughs> it's exactly. not good now. And we can thank the Amazon Fire for that. That is really, really neat. Um, so tell us about some more principles. What are some more principles with well, the Bezos in, letters? It, so I'll move on to the build cycle, right? So one of them there is called obsess over customers. And again, in that original 97 letter, he talked about their focus on customers and every business focuses on customers. That's not really anything new. And it's customer journey, customer focus, customer service. I mean, we have lots of different names for it but I've never heard any other business use the word obsess. And it's a different level of focus in the customer. And when you obsess over customers, you know their wants, needs, and desires so deeply you can invent on their behalf. And that is a phrase he uses a lot. We invent on behalf of the customer. And there were lots of things they did that seemed financially crazy, like Prime when it first came out. You know, how can we afford to pay for shipping? Well, if it's best for the customers, it will eventually be best for Amazon and for our shareholders. That's how he thinks about it. And so, and obsess over customers, you know, we fast forward to today where there certainly are some complaints about Amazon, right? Complaints about employees and warehouse workers and those kinds of things. But the focus has been so much on faster 
So three pillars for Amazon, wide selection. I think we agree they have that. Low prices, uh, most of the time, I won't say all the time, and fast delivery, right? Started with two day, and they even experimented with that. They had three different iterations of free shipping before they came up with Prime. Um, and again, that focus is still there. And I would say maybe we could say too much, you know, maybe a bit more focus on employees. Because again, if the focus is fast delivery, then it's always pushing, pushing, pushing to get those packages out and get them delivered in the fastest way possible. Oh yeah, definitely. And, you know, I love Amazon. I'm telling you, like whenever I have to order for somebody else, it's like two days now, it's not here. <laughs> yeah. There's frustration, right? So again, lots of examples about how that actually works itself out. But I would say that key idea here is what frustrations as a business owner can you remove in your interaction with your customers? And do you even know where those points are, right? So, I mean, easy ones at a doctor's office where you're filling out the same paperwork every time you go visit. Really? Today's world? Where one of my doctors now, iPad, here's what we have, double check it, click, it's all correct, and hand it back. Okay, so that's more of a customer-obsessed focus than this is the way we've always done it, so we can't do it differently. I love it. I love it. Obsess over your customer. And I think Amazon has done a beautiful job with really being the pace setter. They've kind of set all of our expectations now on what we want. Yep. Several economists have, have termed it the Amazon effect. You know, when Amazon goes into an industry or goes into a warehouse that they open, that Amazon effect, because they are leading the way and it does affect other businesses when that happens. Yeah. The next thing that they can do is make things travel at the speed of light, right? Meaning that order a Coca-Cola and it's sitting on my desk one <laughs> oh, minute later. Oh, <laughs> I suspect somebody might be thinking how to do that. Transporters, right? There you go. It just shows up. <laughs> Space portals now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that is neat. So I'm curious. Let's keep going through this model, Steve. This is amazing. Okay. So we've got over testing. We've talked about building. Building. So accelerate. And again, obviously there are other principles there we could talk about, but in Accelerate, one of them, and, and actually your comment earlier about making that transition from a million to five million made me think of this principle. That's why I want to talk about it. It's called generate high velocity decisions. Bezos says one of the problems as a company grows is that they add bureaucracy. And so decision making actually slows down. And when decision making slows down, growth slows down. And so think about it. As a company gets bigger, and, and some of this is kind of interesting in terms of, yeah, but we have to have those layers, right? Supervisors and managers and regional directors, and right? And we've got to have those layers to make sure everything gets done right. And if you believe and encourage successful failure and you're hiring the right people, you need to trust them and give them the authority. So here's how he describes it two doors. One door is what he calls type one decisions. Those are big, strategic, bet the company. Those do need to be made slowly with lots of data, lots of input, and maybe at the end, a gut feeling of what's the right thing to do. So type one decisions are hard to change. He said, but most business decisions are not type one. They're type two. Second door, go through that door. You make a decision. We move forward. Yes, we're going to do this project or whatever it is. Type two decisions are easy to pivot. You don't like what you're seeing or it's not doing what you thought it should do or the results aren't as good as you wanted. In fact, Amazon just did this with their Amazon Fresh stores in the United Kingdom. They weren't seeing the results they were expecting. And so they've announced that they are stopping new stores. Again, type two decision, not bet the farm and they'll pivot to try something else. So this idea that you walk through the door, it's easier to turn around and walk back or look a different direction, make a different decision and go down a different direction. So that's one of the things that hampers businesses as they grow, that bureaucracy they start building in versus making sure they hire the right people and giving them the authority to do those decisions, knowing that absolutely they could make a mistake. And we understand that and can adjust to it. 
I love it. So understanding those type one, those important decisions that really need to be slowly made versus type two that, you know, maybe we can delegate those decisions to, right. to someone that we trust, that we brought right. in and mentored and trained that can go ahead and take those and we can reverse some of it if it ends up being not the best position yeah. that we've ever made. And, you know, one of the tools Amazon uses um, really in this decision making is originally called the six page memo sometimes now called the working backward documents. So in 2004, Jeff Bezos sent an email out to a senior leadership team, right? The small group of top executives and said, no longer will we have any slide oriented presentation at a meeting. Well, what are we going to do? Right? I mean, that literally was, what do you mean? And what he realized is that people put together PowerPoints as a way to hide behind it and not fully think through. And in the meeting, questions start coming up, right? Well, oh, I'm going to address that in the next couple of slides. So you're interrupting the flow. So what he required then from that point on is a physically written memo, maximum of six pages that describes the problem. Actually, it's there are specific components to it. First is a future press release. So in this new product, what's the press release going to say the day re release it to the public? What's the benefit to the customer? And you write that out. And then you have an FAQ. What are all the questions we have about this new product? It could be the Echo, let's say. What are the problems? What skills do we have? What skills don't we have? Who are we going to have to hire? Or what type of person are we going to have to get in order to actually build this thing? That's written out, thought through, and Bezos says it should take a week or two to write a memo for a bigger decision. That's not handed out prior to the meeting. It's handed out at the beginning of the meeting. And literally the first 10, 15, 30 minutes is spent everybody reading the memo. So literally everybody's on the same page and then they open it up for questions and discussion, okay. not a rehashing of what's already written. And you see this idea of writing to flesh out ideas. I think that's what attracted me to the shareholder letters. He practices what he preached, writing those things out, thinking through them, understanding the nuances are really core at Amazon. And in fact, when employees are hired, they are, are interviewing for a job, they are told it's likely for certain positions, you will be asked to produce a written document because writing is so important and is such a good tool to help us understand the depth and the nuances we need in order to continue to grow. I love it. And I mean, there's been studies, psychology about, you know, putting thoughts onto paper and letting it, you know, I mean, just, just retaining knowledge, first of all, I know that's how it works. And you know, when I'm like trying to solve a problem, you know, just starting to write it out. I mean, yep. it just leads to more questions sometimes and, yep. <laughs> and yes. deeper answers. So. And deeper answers. And, that, and I think that's the key idea behind it. And I know, I know for me, I've written for a long time. And honestly, sometimes I don't know what I think until I can write it out, right? Oh, yeah. And all these jumbled thoughts going and putting it down, organizing it and answering questions and uh, delving deeper. Definitely. It can be like his own little scientific experiment there. Right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So we've tested, we build, we've accelerated and yeah, scaling. Scale okay. the fourth. So scaling. And this kind of loops back around to when we first started and talking about what is the difference between successful companies that are no longer here and successful companies that have continued to be successful. And I think one of them and it's principle 14. Um, it's called believe it's always day one. And again, this is a concept that he used in that very first letter. What he said was it's day one for the internet, meaning the internet's brand new. We're still learning about it. And for amazon.com, if we execute well in this idea of being day one and thinking day one, and it really revolves around this idea of the excitement a business owner has that first day they open the doors. You know, does that excitement, is it still there this morning when you walk through the door? And how do you incorporate that? And Bezos was asked a question at a regular all hands meeting. So and he was in the Q&A part. He was in front of a couple thousand Amazon employees in Seattle and had questions that 
employees had submitted. So he looked down and, and kind of chuckled at the next question he had. And he said, I think I know the answer to this question. And the question was, Jeff, what does day two look like? Now, again, day one, concept at Amazon, the building where he had his office is called the day one building. There's a plaque in the lobby that I took a picture of that talks about this is day one. There are still so much to be invented. And he said, day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciating, painful decline, followed by death. And when you look back at some of the histories of some of the companies we already mentioned, it's remarkably similar in terms of their process. And it could take years, right? He says, and he wrote about that later, that question and that his answer. And he went on to say, I'm more interested in what are the defenses to day two, to prevent day two, to keep day one. He identified four, and some of these we've already touched on. First is customer obsession. You know, what does that mean? So focus on the customer, obsess over the customer, invent on their behalf. The second is a skeptical view of proxies, somewhat related, but a little bit different. Now, we know proxies is like stock voting proxies and right standing instead. What he says is, if you rely as a business on the way you've always done it and not focused on the customer, like... Have you ever heard a customer service agent say, oh, that's not our process, or we can't do that, or right, as opposed to being flexible and proxies become more important, the procedures become more important. That's a, a sign that you need to protect against. Third is a eager adoption of external trends. So certainly technology related, maybe other trend related, but you know, and he identified machine learning as a external trend that they were eagerly adopting and working on and trying to figure out. And this may be multiple years you try and figure this out. And then the fourth, high velocity decision making that doesn't slow down growth and the potential. So those four are defenses to day two and uh, protecting a day one mindset. I hope that message resonates. Size here doesn't really matter. Scale might a little bit, but that's in the scale area, how big you are. Actually, the bigger you are, the more important this is. Oh, yeah. And that is so important. You know, like day one is always exciting. You know, you start a new venture, you start a new business, you know, you get a new office. Day one is always like, you know, that's the day of hope, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything can happen. There's unlimited possibilities on day one. And you're right. When you start to get into day two, day three, you're in decline at that point, right? You're just, it's homeostasis, just trying to maintain and to embrace that day one mentality. And, um, you know, it's just so important as a business owner and, and every level is a new devil, right? When you were party of one and you're just adding a new employee, you know, right. you got to change your procedures. Add employees. One, are you going to compromise on standards just because we said earlier, right? It's hard to hire people now. Do you compromise just to get somebody in a position or do you hold out for the right person? And that can be, I'm not saying this is easy, but you know that can be a way to protect that scale, protect that day one thinking and continue to help you move forward in the long term. Definitely. So we talked about testing, we talked about building, we talked about accelerating and we talked about scaling. Steve, is there any more? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are all kinds of principles we could jump in here, but um, again, I think, let me do maybe one last one, and this is in the build area. It's called Understand Your Flywheel. Story behind it for Amazon is Jim Collins, the book, Good to Great, which that book. likely is on your shelf or you know other people's shelves. If you go to chapter eight, it's called The Flywheel and the Doom Loop, and Jim Collins was invited by Bezos to an offsite senior leadership team meeting in August of when it was published, 2000, and I'm forgetting the date right now, but a month before it actually was published, 2001, I believe. And they spent all day talking about the flywheel. And that senior leadership team literally sketched out, spent the day sketching out their flywheel. So the concept is. The flywheel, again, think about it, typically big metal thing, hard to get started, but once you get it going, 
it tends to run not on its own, but continued input, but it's easier. And at Amazon, they realized, you know, what are the things that drive Amazon? And for Amazon at the time, growth was the primary thing. That's not necessarily true for every business, but most it is. And so what were the things that would drive growth? Well, again, we've mentioned a few of those. One is a website experience that would bring customers back and an experience that would have customers tell others, oh, have you checked out Amazon? It's really easy type of thing. So the more customers that came to the website, the more the negotiating power they had with manufacturers to lower prices, lower prices brought more customers to the website. And then they added on Marketplace uh, in 2002-ish, meaning third-party sellers could actually use Amazon's platform to sell products on their site. And again, we could talk about that crazy idea. What company invites their competitors on their site. But if we go back to obsess over customers, the same phrase, if it's better for customers, if a third-party seller, Bezos is saying this, as a third-party seller has a product that we don't, that's better for the customer. If a third-party seller can sell it cheaper than we can, that's better for the customer and eventually will be better for Amazon and for our shareholders. So some of those crazy ideas were grounded in the principles that I believe are well articulated in the shareholder letters. I love it. I absolutely love it. Very, very good juicy morsels there, Steve, for us to think about um, with that. And I'm curious, you know, when you see businesses that are implementing the Basil's principles and they're focusing on these things and there's that, and I know we started the episode talking about risk and grow. Where do you see it go wrong? Where do most businesses fail? Interesting question. So this is not easy, right? Any one of these principles are actually really counterintuitive to what most people think about a business, like having your competitors sell on your site. That's crazy talk, right? Except it isn't. Now, because, and they thought through it, Amazon makes a fee, right, on every one of those sales for their delivery and fulfillment. And I think the other thing is long-term thinking versus short-term. One of the things Bezos was very successful at, and he says this in his, again, that very first letter is, we will make long-term decisions, not short-term Wall Street expectations. That's really hard to go against that grain. And he was successful at being able to do that. That's really hard for a small business owner to kind of go against what the common knowledge is and look at doing something different. What I've seen and actually personally experienced, I started a new business last year based on a lot of these different principles, and it's hard to keep it going, and it's hard to explain it to employees so they, and and it's really, uh, what I'm finding is it's almost a constant thing. I have to believe it in order for them to believe it and, you know, show how we can implement this stuff to the benefit of, again, our customers and clients. I love it. And Steve, as we wrap up today, you know, one of the things that I like to ask my guests, because you've shared so many juicy morsels, so we're all pins and needles to find out what you're going to say. If you could leave our viewers and our listeners with one piece of advice, it can be business, it can be personal. What would that piece of advice be? Oh, so many things running through my head. Top of mind right now, one of my processes, I'm a big on goal setting. And I think where that goes wrong is having these big lofty goals, maybe annually, you know, maybe quarterly, but not bringing those down to -to day-to-day. So one of the things I do every day is look at my goals briefly and then determine what are three things I can do today that would move me forward in achieving that goal. So it reminds me of the movie, What About Bob? baby steps, right? And we kind of get lost in, oh, I've got all this stuff to do. And I've got these 40 things on my to-do list. But for me, it's narrowing it down to what are the three most important things I can do today? And that does a couple of things. One, it focuses. Two, it gives me wins at the end of the day when I can check off, wow, okay, I got that done. And that forward momentum continues to help me move forward. So, you know, some form or version of that Big, audacious goals are really important and really helpful. And then thinking through, 
you know, what are the steps I can take? And maybe nothing today on that goal, but another goal, I can do a few things. I love it. I love it. Really, really great advice on that one, the, the baby steps and the goal setting there. And Steve, what is the best way for our viewers and our listeners? What's the best way for them to find you, to contact you, to work with you, find copies of your book, which by the way, the Bezos Letters, 14 Principles to Grow Your Business like Amazon. Yep. Um, definitely check that book out. What's the best way for them to contact well, you and reach you? Sure. So uh, the book is on Amazon and the book website is thebezosletters.com. And there's some additional information there. At the end of every chapter of the book, I have questions. I wanted to help people think through how it applies to them. And so there's a little bit of a workbook where you can uh, write down the answers to some of those questions there just as a tool to help you with um, applying those principles within your own organization. And then my email address is steve at thebezosletters.com. And my primary social platform is LinkedIn. And so I have quite a few followers there. And uh, so connect with me, let me know you listened uh, to the podcast, and I'll be glad to connect to you. And I post information about the book consistently there. I love it. I love it. And I'm going to be a little sarcastic, guys. Go to um, Barnes and Nobles and order the book, Bezos Letters. <laughs> it's supposed to grow your business like Amazon. <laughs> well, so I don't normally talk too much about this, but actually um, you can order it at Barnes and Noble. Um, but when the book first came out, um, we found out that the head of business book bank refused to stock our book because it was about Amazon. Even though they can charge a shipping and handling fee, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Sharing your knowledge was just amazing. We really enjoy picking your brain today and learning about these um, great principles. So thank you very much for sharing Oh, my your pleasure, knowledge. Suzanne. Again, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed thank our you, conversation. Thank you, Steve.